A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, Book Two, The Golden Thread, Chapter 22, The Sea Still Rises. Hagar, son Antoine, had had only one exultant week in which to, his, to soften his modicum of hard and bitter bread to such extent as he could, with a relish of fraternal embraces and congratulations. When Madame Defarge sat at her counter as usual, presiding over the customers, Madame Defarge wore no rose in her head, for the great brotherhood of spies had become, even in one short week, extremely chary of trusting themselves to the saints' mercies. The lamps across his streets had a portentously an elastic swing with them. Madame Defarge, with her arms folded, sat in the morning light and heat, contemplating the wine shop in the street. In both, there were several knots of loungers, squalid and miserable, but now with a manifest sense of power enthroned on their distress. The raggedest nightcap Ari on the wretchedest head had this crooked significance in it. I know how hard it is. It has grown for me, the wearer of this, to support life and myself. But do you know how easy it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to destroy life in you? Every lean bare arm that had been without work before had this work already always ready for it now, but it could that it could strike. The fingers of the knitted women were vi vicious with the experience that they could tear. There were was a change in the appearance of San Antoine. The image had been hammering into this for hundreds of years. And the last finishing blows had told mightily on the expression. Madame Defarge sat observing it with such suppressed approval as was to be desired in the leader of the Saint Antoine women. One of her sisters hood knitted beside her, the short, rather plump wife of the starved grocer, and the mother of two children, Withel, this lieutenant had already earned the complimentary name of the Vengeance. Hark, said the Vengeance, listen then, who comes? As if a train of powder laid from the outermost bound of San Antoine Quarter to the wine shop door had been suddenly fired, a fast-spreading murmur came rushing along. It is Defarge, said Madame. Silence, patriots. Defarge came in breathless, pulled off a red cap he wore, and looked around him. Listen everywhere, said Madame again. Listen to him. Defarge stood panting against a background of eager eyes and open mouths formed open th outside the door. All those within the wine shop had sprung their feet. Say then, my husband, what is it? News from the other world. How then, cried Madame contemptuously, the other world. Does everybody here recall old Follin, who told the, the famished people that they might eat grass who died and went to hell? Everybody from all throats. The news is of him. He is among us. Among us from the universal throat again. And dead? Not dead. He feared us so much as with reason, and so much and with reason, that he caused himself to be represented as dead, and had a grand mock funeral. But they had found him alive, hiding in the country, and have brought him in. I have seen him but now, on his way to the Hotel de Ville, a prisoner. I have seen that he had reason to fear us. Say all, had he reason. Wretched old sinner of more than 
three score years and ten. If he had never known it yet, he would have known it in his heart of hearts if he could have heard the answering cry. A moment of profound silence followed. Defarge and his wife looked steadfastly at one another. The vengeance stopped, and the jar of, of a drum was heard as she moved it at her feet behind the counterpart counter. Patriots, said Defarge in the determined voice, are we ready? Instantly, Madame Defarge's knife was in her girdle. The drum was beating in the streets, as if it and the drummer had flown together by magic, and the vengeance, un uttering ter 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 terrific shrieks, and flinging her arms about her head like all the forty furries at once, was tearing from house to house, rousing the women. The men were terrible in the bloody-minded anger with which they looked from windows, caught up what arms they had, and came pouring down into the streets. But the women were a sh sight to chill the boldest. From such household occupations as they bear poverty yielded, from their ch children, from their aged, and their sick crouching on the bare ground, famished and naked, they ran out with streaming hair, urging one another and themselves to madness with the widest, wildest cries of action. A villain Fallon taken, my sister. Old Fallon taken, my mother. Miscreant Fallon taken, my daughter. Then a score of others ran into the midst of the these, be beating be their breasts, tearing their hair and screaming, Fallon alive. Fallon who told the starving people they might eat grass. Foulon, who told my old father that he might eat grass when I had no bread to give him. Foulon, who told my baby it might suck grass when these breasts went, were dried with want. O oh, mother of God, this Foulon, O oh, heaven, our suffering, hear me, my dead baby and my withered father. I swore on my knees on these stones to avenge you on Foulon. Husbands and brothers and young men, give us the blood of Folon, give us the head of Folon, give us the heart of Folon, give us the body and soul of Folon, red Folon to pieces, and dig him into the ground, that grass may grow from him. With these cries, numbers of the women, lashed into blind frenzy, whirled about, striking and tearing at their old own friends until they dropped into a passionate swoon and were only saved by um, the men belonging to them from the tramp from being trampled underfoot nevertheless not a moment was lost not a moment this foulon was at the hotel de ville and might be loosed lucid never if Saint Antoine knew his own sufferings, insults, and wrongs, armed men and women flocked out of the quarter so fast, and drew even these last dregs after them with such a force of suction, that within a quarter of an hour there was not a human creature in Saint Antoine's bosom, but a few old crones and, a wa and the wailing children. No, they were all by that time choking the hall of examination where this old man, ugly and wicked, was an overflowing into an adjacent open space and streets. The Defarges, husband and wife, the Vengeance, and Jacques Three were in the first press, and at no great distance from him in the hall. See, cried Madame, pointing with her knife. See the old villain bound with ropes. That was well done to tie a bunch of grass upon his back. Ha ha, that was well done. 
Let him eat it now. Madame put her knife upon her arm and clapped her hands as at a play. The people immediately behind Madame Defarge, explaining the cause of her satisfaction to those behind them, and those again explaining to others, and those to others, the neighboring streets resounded with the clapping of hands. Similarly, during two or three hours of drawl, and the winnowing of many bushels of words, Madame Defarge's frequent expressions of impatience were taken up with marvelous quickness at the distance, the more readily because certain men who had by some wonderful exercise of agility climbed up the external architecture to look in from the windows, knew Madame Defarge well, and acted as a telegraph between her and the crowd outside the building. At length the sun rose so high that it struck a kindly ray as of hope or protection, directly down upon the old prisoner's head. The favor was too much to bear. In an instant the bearer of dust and chaff that had stood surprisingly long went to the winds, and Saint Antoine had got him. It was known directly to the furthest confines of the crowd. Defarge had but sprung over a railing and the table, and enfolded the miserable, miserable wretch in the deadly embrace. Madame Defarge had but followed and turned her head in one of the ropes with which he was tied. The Vengeance and Jacques Three were not yet up with them, and the men in, at the windows had not yet swooped into the halls, the hall like birds of prey from their high perches. When the cry seemed to go up all over the city, bring him out, bring him to the lamp. Down and up and head and foremost on the steps of the building, now on his knees, now on his feet, now on his back, dragged and struck at and stifled, stifled by the bunches of grass and straw that, that were thirst, thrust into his face by hundreds of hands, torn, bruised, panting, bleeding, yet always entreating and beseeching for mercy, now full, full of vehement agony of action, with the small clear space about him as the people drew one another back that they might see, now a log of dead wood drawn through the forest of leaves. He was hauled to a nearest street corner where one of the fatal lamps swung. And there Madame Defarge let him go, as a cat might have done to a mouse, and silently and composedly looked at him while they made ready. And while he besought her, the women passionately screeching at him all the time, and the men sternly calling out to have him killed with grass in his mouth. One he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking twice he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they call, caught him shrieking. Then the rope was merciful, and hailed him, and his head was seen upon a pike, with grass enough in the mouth for all Saint Antoine to dance at the sight of. Nor was this the end of the day's bad work. For Saint Antoine was so shouted and danced his angry blood up that it boiled up on a hearing when the day closed in that the son-in-law of the dispatched after the people's enemies and insulters was coming into Paris under an, a guard five hundred strong in cavalry alone. Saint Antoine wrote his crimes on flaring sheets of paper, seized him, would have torn him out of the breast of an army to bear for long company, set his head and heart on pikes, and carried the three spoils of the day in wolf procession through the streets. 
Not before dark night did the men and women come back to the children wailing and breadless. Then the miserable baker's shops were beset by long flies of them, patiently waiting to buy bad bread. And while they waited with stomachs faint and empty, they beguiled the time by embracing one another on the triumphs of the day and achieving them again in gossip. Gradually, these strings of ragged people shortened and frayed away, and then poor lights began to shine on high windows, and slender fires were made in the streets, and where neighbors cooked in common, afterwards supping at their doors. Scanty and insufficient suppers, those, and innocent of meat, as of most other sauce to wretched bread. Yes, human fellowship infused some nourishment into the flinty viance and struck some sparks of cheerfulness out of them. Fathers and mothers who had had their full share in the worst of the day played gently with their meager children and lovers with such a world around them and before them loved and hoped. It was almost morning when Defarge's wine shop parted with its last knot of customers, and Monsieur Defarge said to Madame's wife in husky tones while fasting the door, At last it has come, my dear. Eh, well, returned Madame, almost. Saint Antoine swept, slept. The Defarges slept. Even the vengeance slept with her starved grocer, and the drum was at rest. The drums was the only voice in Saint Antoine that blood and hurry had not changed. The vengeance, as custodian of the drum, could have wakened him up and had him had the same speech out of him as before the Bastille fell, or old Foulon was seized. Not so with uh, the hoarse tones of the men and women in Saint Antoine's bosom.